Welcome to the Dire Mall West in-depth dungeon guide for both Horde and Alliance. As always, timestamps, requests, complex trash pulls, strategies, and bosses in their respective loots can be found below. Scroll down if you'd like to participate in this video's giveaway, and congrats to the previous winner, Mr. Relinov, who immediately knew that I used the Diablo soundtrack. Dire Mall West, otherwise known as the Capital Gardens, is our third and final wing of Dire Mall. The remnants of the once glorious Highborn, or at least what's left of them, now reside in the Capital Gardens. The gardens are littered with ancient relics jailing the demon the elves once used to fuel their immortality. Succumbing to what they tried to escape, the halls now ring with the clatter of the skeletons and phantoms of the Chandralar. Deep within the dungeon we can find an ancient library still occupied by some of the elves who managed to maintain their sanity. Dyrmal West is slightly less difficult than its northern counterpart, and even connects to the Gordok Commons once you finish the dungeon. There are quite a few quests we can complete here. As such, I've included a route on the quickest way to enter the library timestamp below, as the majority of the quests can be found there. The dungeon entrance can be found here. As for group composition, any tank and healer will do. Range DPS excels here, so I'd highly recommend bringing two of any caster or a hunter, and a warrior to fill out the rest. A druid tank, shaman or paladin, warlock, warrior, and shadow priest would do just fine in the capital gardens. The ideal level range is 58 to 60, but you can enter as early as level 45 if you so desire. Like the northern wing, we'll need the crescent key from Pusselin to enter. Talk to me. Hurry back. Starting off our quests, we have the Madness Within from the Shendralar Ancient, who will task us with killing Imolthar and Prince Torthaldrin. Once you've completed these feats, return to her, and she'll give you the follow-up, The Treasure of the Shendralar. This quest will send us back to the library where we fought the prince. Beneath the stairwell, we can interact with the chest. Interact with it to close out this questline. Our next set of quests will require you to return a book to Lorekeeper Mykos within the library. These books can be dropped or found within any of the wings of the dungeon, and are all class-specific. In the interest of saving time, I have listed each book and the respective class, as well as their respective reward, but know that they all just require you to head to Mykos. Paladins and warriors can pick up an exclusive epic book titled Thor's Compendium of Dragonslaying. This can be dropped off of any boss at a fairly low drop chance, or found as a dusty tome within any of the wings. Once you find the book, be it by chance or from the auction house, head to Lorekeeper Lydros in the library, who will give you a dull and flat elven blade, which will begin the next part of the quest, the forging of Quelserar. After exchanging words with Lydros, he'll give you an unfired ancient blade. This blade will need to be placed before Anixia and be bestowed by her breath. This blade is a one-time use, so if you wipe or accidentally use it, you'll need to return to Lydros. During the Anixia encounter, once you have her below 30%, place the blade before her and wait for her to do her breath attack. Once registered, the blade will become heated. Pick the blade up, and once Anixia has been slain, you'll have 20 minutes to dive the sword into her corpse. So don't leave the raid or go AFK before you've done this. Once complete, return to Lydros and you'll be rewarded with Quelserar. Paladins and Warlocks will find themselves here on their journey to acquire their epic mount. I'll have a guide for each respective class for those of you interested in this questline linked below. Warlocks can summon a boss in this instance as well, which I'll cover later in this guide. Before I dive into our bosses, you'll see arcane pylons surrounded by mana elementals all throughout the dungeon. Make sure you kill all of these elementals as they'll be necessary to proceed further into the dungeon. You'll need to clear 5, so make sure you're keeping tabs. I've marked them all on this map in case you find it necessary. Our first boss is Tendris Warpwood, found at the base of the courtyard. Make sure you've cleared out all of the tree ancients as they'll aggro upon engaging him. Tendris is fairly simple, but can be quite annoying. DPS will want to give the tank a few seconds to generate aggro here, as he has an entangle which will root a random target for up to 10 seconds. This can be dispelled, so if your tank loses aggro, make sure this is cleared from him so they can regain their footing. Range will need to keep their distance as Tendris will use Grasping Vines, which will do area damage around the Treant, stun for a short duration, and also root for up to 10 seconds. Again, if the tank loses aggro during this period, make sure they're dispelled. Lastly, Tendris will trample, dealing a fairly decent chunk of damage to those around him. 
Tendris can be tough if your group is mostly composed of melee, but so long as your healer can keep their distance and get out uninterrupted heals, this fight should prove little challenge. Going back up the steps, to the north, and into the large room labeled the Court of the Highborn, we can encounter our first and only rare, Tsuzi. Tsuzi is a fairly easy mob that has the kit of a rogue. Quite often, she'll use Sinister Strike, which will deal a physical damage hit. What can make Tsuzi a bit of a threat is her gouge, which will stun for 4 seconds, and her blind, which will disorient a target for 10 seconds. If these occur on your tank or healer, be prepared to use a cooldown, or divert healing as she can hit fairly hard. Past this, she's pretty easy, but she doesn't drop anything too rewarding. At the center of the Court of the Highborn, we can encounter Magister Calandris. Calandris is basically a Shadow Priest, minus the healing. He'll be in Shadow form, which increases his damage done and reduces his damage taken by 40%. His main ability is Mindflay, which will channel damage to a target and slow them for 3 seconds. This can be interrupted, so do so if necessary. Calandras will also use Shadow Word Pain. This inflicts a shadow damage over time debuff. The Magister's final damaging ability is Mind Blast, which will deal a large burst of shadow damage. What makes Calandras dangerous is his Dominate Mind, which will mind control a target for a few seconds. Crowd control the target and use cooldowns if necessary, as this can occur to the healer or tank. We've dealt with more than enough mind controls up until this point, so you should be able to handle this boss with the ease. Head back the way you came from, and up the stairs, and we can encounter Ileana Ravenoak and her pet bear Farah, patrolling the upper court. Ileana acts as a hunter, thus you can negate all but one of her abilities by staying within a close distance. My preferred strategy is focusing Ileana and then moving on to finish off Vera. Ileana's kit consists of Aim Shot, which is a charged, high damaged arrow, Concussive Shot, which will slow, Volley, her area of effect ability, and lastly, an Immolation Trap, which will deal fire damage over time. Burn her down and stay close, and she'll pose no threat. Her pet Vera is also quite easy. She comes with a Charge and a Maul, which will increase the damage of her next attack. This should be one of the easiest fights in the dungeon, as such, there isn't too much to worry about here. Once Ileana and her pet bear are dead, head back down to where you fought Tendris. You should now be able to access the doorway with your crescent key. Follow the tunnel down. Once you've cleared up all of the pylons, you'll be able to enter the prison of Imulthar. Imulthar can be quite tough. As such, your group will need to stay coordinated and position well, as his hard hits, area of effect damage, and summoned adds can overwhelm the party. Quite commonly, Imulthar will trample, dealing area damage like Tendris does. He'll also use Infected Bite, which will deal damage over time and increase the damage taken by the tank. As such, dispel if possible. You'll need to assign one of your ranged, or someone with mobility, to patrol around the room and kill the eyes the demon spawns. The eyes inflict a nasty debuff that slows and cuts attack and casting speed severely, so make sure they're being killed off quickly. Imulthar's final ability is a teleport that will send a random party member to the center of the room. If this happens to the tank, give them a second to regain aggro. At 50% he'll enrage, so prepare for some big hits to go out onto the tank. It's imperative that the eyes are taken out. If you can manage this, and the healer can keep the tank topped off through the burst damage, Imulthar can easily be killed. If you have a warlock in the party, and they're on the appropriate part of their epic mount quest line, they can summon the dreadlord, Lord Helnaroth. The boss himself is quite easy, but the waves leading up to him can be brutal. I've linked a guide on how to complete him in the comments below. At last, we can head to the library and encounter our final boss of the gardens, Prince Torthaldrin. The prince hits quite fast and hard. This is another fight where positioning is important, and healers will want to do everything they can to keep the tank topped off, as Torthaldrin can burn the tank down in a matter of seconds. Start the fight off by dragging him to a wall or corner as he'll deal a burst of damage and knock back with his arcane blast. This will also clear the aggro from the tank, so make sure you taunt immediately afterwards or he'll melt your party. To add to his burst damage, the prince has Thrash, which is a wind fury that will occur occasionally. Keep him away from your group as he also has Whirlwind, but this damage is negligible as long as you have aggro. Lastly, he'll Counterspell, which will interrupt casting in silence for 15 seconds. If you have aggro, do not cast. I'd highly advise against having a Paladin tank for this fight. 
Overall, this fight is completely dependent on the tank. Once he knocks back, you'll need to taunt or your party will die in seconds if they don't use cooldowns. Stay against the wall and healers, make sure the tank is topped off at all times. If you can manage to keep the tank up through this, you'll have finished the final wing of Dire Maul. That was it for the Dire Maul guides. Thank you for watching, and thank you to my Patreon nibs. As always, have a fantastic day, and I'll see you in the next video, which should be the Upper Blackrock Spire Guide.